preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Helene Guys Marquatz, and I'm director of the Center for Adult Life and Learning at the 92nd Street Y. And as always, it is my pleasure to welcome you here. Just a few things coming up. You know, we like to give you a preview if we can, um, and remind you of things that maybe you forgot about. I think I told you last time that uh, we will be having Dustin Hoffman here with Charlie Rose on April 7th. So for those of you who have not bought your tickets yet, please do if you are interested in that evening. Also on Wednesday, May 12th, William Buckley will be discussing In Search of Antisemitism. And on Tuesday, May 11th, you can be with us that whole week, uh, Leon Botstein, president of Bard College, will we'll be talking about America's educational crisis what should be done. And for those of you who read the article on Dr. Botstein in the Sunday Times Magazine section a few weeks ago, you know that he is a very outspoken critic of our higher education system. And uh, it's my sense that the sparks will fly that evening. Also coming up, we have two evenings on Balanchine. Many of you realize I'm sure that it is the 10th anniversary of his death this year and you'll be seeing more and more on it. We are, are focusing our attention on his Hollywood years and for those two evenings we will have his former wife and leading lady during that time. Her non-stage name is Brigitte Lieberson but her stage name is Vera Zarina. Uh, she is remains beautiful and uh, a wonderful woman, and we're very much looking forward to those two evenings. That's April 1st and April 8th. That's it. I'm afraid the, the storm took its toll on our audience for this evening, uh, but I'm very glad that you all made it out. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you this evening the man who will be introducing our lecturer. He is the chairman of the executive committee of the American Friends of Hebrew University, and he is Mr. Stanley Bogan. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As chairman of the executive committee of the American Friends of the Hebrew University, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the second in our series of minds that made the 20th century. This series features faculty members from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and we are extremely gratified that the 92nd Street Y, New York's premier Jewish educational institution, is continuing this association with us. The Hebrew University is Israel's oldest and largest university. Founded in 1925, its original Board of Governors reads like a who's who of, Jew of Jewry during that period. On the board were Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud, both of whom are subjects of lectures in this series. Today, the Hebrew University enrolls more than 23,000 students on four campuses in Israel, and it offers graduate and undergraduate degrees in most academic disciplines. The American Friends of the Hebrew University helps the university by raising funds and supporting public programs, such as this one, to give the university and its faculty public exposure in the United States. We welcome your participation in our activities. I am proud and honored to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Shlomo Avineri, the, Hebrew, the Herbert Samuel Professor of Political Science at the Hebrew University. Born in Poland, he emigrated to Palestine and was educated at the Hebrew University, receiving the PhD degree in 1963. He has been a visiting professor at many outstanding American universities, including Yale, Cornell, Wesleyan, and the University of California. Outside of academia, he has served as Director General of Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and was, and was a chosen member of the International Observation Team for the 1989 elections in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. One of the leading authorities on Hegel and Marx, he is an author of five books, 
including a work on the thought and theory of Karl Marx. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Shlomo Avineri. Good evening. Karl Marx was born 175 years ago, to those of you who want to celebrate, it's May the 5th, 1818. Uh, a few years ago, until a few years ago, his statue adorned, if this is the right word, the public space of many countries in Eastern Europe and, of course, in China and other places east. Today, with the exception of China, which is a very funny kind of communist country, moving quickly into capitalism, uh, Karl Marx is a patron saint of such strange places like North Korea uh, and Cuba. And certainly Marx would have been slightly flabbergasted to find out that this is the place says, where still he is considered to be a prophet. I'm sure he would have also been a little bit uneasy to find out that the Hebrew University is including him somehow uh, in its curriculum uh, for an American Jewish audience in New York. I mean, there are a lot of contradictions here, as you are aware of. Now, what I'd like to do tonight uh, is to focus on three very disparate topics, all of them connected with Karl Marx. One, I'll try to say a few things about his personal background, because it is of some interest in terms of general history and in terms of Jewish history. Then I'll try to assess what I think were his major achievements, looking now in retrospect. And then I'll try to say where I think he was really wrong. As I said, Karl Marx was born on May 5th, 1818 in a city which is now in Germany, West Germany, Trier, not far away from the French border. He was born to a family which had a long rabbinical history. And I want to go, with your permission, into some detail into the family background, because I'm, I'm sure that if I would have passed around a piece of paper and asked each of you uh, to write down uh, his family background, some would have said that he was born Jewish, some would have said that he was born in a Jewish family, others would say that he was a converted Jew, and some worse things could have been said in this context. And I think we have to be, be very specific because I think it is important to understand the family background. Marx's grandfather was a rabbi in the city of Trier. And like many Jews in Germany of that time, he did not have a family name because Jews did not have family names, surnames. And uh, he was, uh, Marx's grandfather, was a rabbi by the Hebrew appellation of Rabbi Shmuel ben Rab Mordechai Halevi. And if any one of you is interested, the background of, family of, of the Marx family was a Levi family. The reason why the family became called Marx was that the French Revolutionary Army occupied or liberated, I mean, we always can argue about that, uh, I mean about Trier in uh, 1805, uh, the city of Trier imposed French rule and annexed it to France and made people civilized and modern, which included emancipating the Jewish population and also giving its surnames. If it wouldn't, and therefore the family became known as Marx, because Marx is Mordechai, Marcus, so that's how the name Marx was appended to the family name, which was really the Jewish name Levi. Imagine that the French would not impose regular family names on the population. Marx would be known as Levi. There would be something called Levism, <laughs> anti-Levism, possibly Levism Leninism, <laughs> you realize it wouldn't really fly. <laughs> now, uh, Marx's father is, was one of the people who benefited from the French annexation of the city because the annexation which introduced the French revolutionary code uh, and law 
emancipated Jewish people, allowed Jewish people into the professions, and Marx's father, who was named Heschel, Marx uh, studied law and became a lawyer in the city of Trier uh, under French rule. After the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, the city was annexed to Prussia. It never belonged to Prussia because Prussia is an Eastern German uh, entity, but it was annexed to Prussia. And the Prussian administration in Trier and in this whole area of West Germany, the Rhineland, Cologne, Bonn, those areas, found itself with a very unusual problem regarding its Jewish population. In Prussia proper, Berlin, Brandenburg, the eastern reaches of Germany, Jews were tolerated, but Prussia was a Christian state, which meant that Jews had a right to practice their religion, provided they did not do it too much in public and didn't make too much noise about it, but they were tolerated, but they were not allowed into the professions or into public service. So Jews in Prussia proper could not be civil servants, could not serve in the army, could not be teachers at universities or even uh, uh, public schools, elementary schools, nor could they be lawyers or notaries because the lawyer, after all, is an officer of the court. And the idea is that in a Christian state, a Jewish person should not be in a position where he is in command or in control of the Christian subjects of the King of Prussia. In the western areas, which were just annexed to Prussia, Jews have been emancipated by the French. So the Prussian bureaucracy, very decent, very well ordered, found itself in a very unusual situation. It had two kinds of Jews. In Prussia proper, tolerated Jews, but Jews who were not equal subjects, could not become judges and lawyers and teachers, and Jews in the Western newly acquired territories, which were lawyers and doctors and uh, public officials. And this created an anom anomaly. Could somebody who was uh, practicing law in Trier move to another part of Prussia, Berlin, and practice law there or not? What should be done? There were obviously two alternatives. One, to extend the emancipation of Jews the equal footing in the law to the Jews of Prussia proper, or the other one was to revoke the emancipation and push the Jews who were emancipated in the Western provinces back into, so to speak, the pre-modern, pre-revolutionary medieval ghetto. And the Prussian bureaucracy, being decent and enlightened and Christian at the same time, uh, didn't really know how to handle it for two years. In the end, they decided that uh, the old Prussian law would be extended to the Western provinces, and all people, all Jewish people who were public servants or lawyers in those newly acquired provinces had to make a choice. Either convert to Christianity and maintain their positions, or if they insisted on remaining members of the Jewish community, they had to give up their positions. And this is exactly the position in which Karl Marx's father in the year 1815 found himself. By that time he was married uh, to another, uh, to a lady, Jewish lady, a daughter, granddaughter of, of rabbis, and uh, he had a family already to support. He was a relatively successful lawyer. He was not an active member of the Jewish community under the French revolutionary regime. He was one of those emancipated, enlightened, uh, we would say today, uh, alienated or whatever Jewish uh, people. He was not in any way active religiously. He considered himself a son of the Enlightenment, a student of Voltaire and Olbach. Uh, only recently did we find in the Prussian state archives uh, the correspondence which uh, Heschel Marx, Marx's father, had with the Prussian authorities. He petitioned them with a very moving letter to allow him to maintain his, whatever it was, position uh, without having to uh, be baptized. And the letter is written in sort of Prussian uh, uh, subject language, but it's, very, as I said, very moving. 
He said that he is of a Jewish family, however, not a member of the Jewish community, which was technically and factually true. He considers himself a citizen of the world and of the state of Prussia. Furthermore, he says that the regulation that says that he will be able to maintain his position as a lawyer only if he converts puts, he thinks, not only him, but also the Prussian state into a very peculiar position. The Prussian state being a Christian state certainly doesn't want people to become Christians because they want to maintain their occupation. In the Christian way, this is not the way to become Christian. And therefore, he petitions very obediently the uh, Prussian authorities not to make him do something against his conscience, which he thinks is also against the conscience of Prussia as a Christian state. A very complicated and complex, and if you wish, interesting argumentation. The correspondent went back and forth. The answer was no, this is the law. And after a year of corresponding very reluctantly, Karl uh, Marx's father converted. Now, how did he convert? To those of you who know the political and the religious geography of Germany, Trier is a Catholic area like all of the Rhineland. By at that time, 1816, there was no Protestant church in Trier. There were only Catholics and a few hundred Jews. Marx converts to Protestantism. Marx's father. Now, we talk about assimilation, integration. Uh, there was no pastor in Trier, because this is a Catholic area only recently integrated to Prussia. So Heschel Marx finds a gar the garrison pastor of the Prussian garrison, which is bivouacked outside the city, and very privately and quietly uh, converts to Protestantism. Only he, not his family, not his wife. And then he returns to his home in Trier. And rather than being a member of the Jewish minority, which numbered a few hundred people, he became a member of the Prussian minority, which was perhaps 20 families. So we talk about integration, assimilation, becoming part of the majority culture. It's much more complicated. It is, if you wish, a, uh, not only something that was done very reluctantly, with no enthusiasm, but with the vengeance to do it in a certain way. Of course, it's easier for a Jewish agnostic to convert to Protestantism than to Catholicism, but it's not joining the majority community in any way. From what I was able to ascertain, the only other time he ever visit, uh, went to church was a few years later. When Karl Marx was born, 1818, his father was already Protestant. We could say nominal, but he was Protestant. He was baptized. His mother was still Jewish. I'm sure the Israeli chief rabbinate would have a problem classifying the young Karl as whatever uh, he was. When he was born, he was certainly not circumcised, but he was not baptized either. Only after the maternal grandfather, the father of Karl Marx's mother, who was a rabbi also, died, did the mother and two children in the year 1822 be, were baptized. And this is, as far as we know, the second and only other time that Karl Marx's father entered a church. Now, when we look at that, we realize that here we deal with a very specific impact of what happened in the French Revolution, which on one hand emancipated Jews, allowed them into European society, and then under the era of the Restoration, the reaction of 1815, in this particular area of the Rhineland, the Jews were thrown back into the ghetto. Nowhere else, with one exception in Piemont in Italy, did we have something like this, where Jews were allowed in and 20 years later being kicked out. And if we look very carefully, we find that in the area of the Rhineland, where Jews were emancipated and then de-emancipated, a whole serious 
of revolutionaries come out of that background. Heinrich Heine comes again from the same background. He also studied law and in order to practice law, baptized himself. As he said in his language, uh, I got the passport to European culture. And uh, other people, uh, Moses Hess, all of them sooner or later left Germany, immigrated to Paris, and in my mind, I think, the immigration to Paris was not only an immigration to the capital of the French Revolution, somehow it was also an immigration to the capital of the country which emancipated their parents. All of those people became anti-German nationalists, revolutionaries, and socialists. So it is in this niche between emancipation and de-emancipation that we have a whole generation of young, emancipated, intellectual people of Jewish origin whose family thinks that they were allowed into the garden of European culture, but they found themselves being thrown out. And one of the responses was a response of revolutionary radicalism. All of them developed. Heine developed in a different way. Marx developed in a different way. Hess developed in a different way. Each of them related to the Jewish heritage in different ways. But there is this very specific case. Jews from Prussia, Eastern Germany, did not go through that. And we have very few revolutionary Jews coming from Berlin, Leipzig, and Dresden. Perhaps one, Ferdinand Lassalle, but nobody else. Whereas the Jewish communities of the Rhineland, which were emancipated and de-emancipated then, give us dozens upon dozens of more law known or less known Jewish uh, revolutionaries of this very particular Jewish background. Uh, the frustrated ones, the ones who were allowed in and thrown out. And I think we should minimize the impact of that, this development, with, which suggests that modernization and emancipation. And the fact that through the French Revolution, Jews were allowed into general society, but then they found themselves in great difficulties under those circumstances, precisely after 1815, that the road to modernity and emancipation and equality for many Jewish communities and individuals was a very rocky one. And it created the kind of dissonance, the kind of alienation, the kind of feeling of estrangement and bitterness that made so many of those people into revolutionaries. And I thought that it is important to realize this background because it has been glossed over in many, on many, many levels. Now, when one looks at the literary output of Marx, it is impressive. I'm now on the editorial board that uh, is trying to put together a definite edition of uh, Karl Marx, and we got in the last five years some help from East Germany when it still existed, from the Soviet Union when it still existed. It will take much m longer time, but it's a very impressive output. And uh, some of you may be surprised that it's not only uh, pamphlets and uh, treatises, uh, there is also poetry. Uh, a few years ago, a very interesting uh, poem was found. L letters Marx wrote to his wife, including a love letter. When I first saw it, uh, I read it to my wife, saying, this is Karl Marx. And she said to me, why do you study Marx rather than write letters like this to me? <laughs> and I think she was right. When I showed the letter to some of my uh, friends at the Hebrew University who know something about German literature, and I didn't tell them this is Karl Marx, I said, I, where is this letter from? One said, well, this is obviously Heinrich Heine. Uh, another said, this is, uh, oh, well, I think I remember this. This is uh, Goethe's uh, The uh, Young uh, Werther. Uh, it is exactly in the sort of romantic mood in which, just to give you the imagery, he starts by addressing his wife, this is after 10 years of marriage, and a number of crises, including a crisis in which Marx fathered an illegitimate son on the housemaid uh, that lived with them. So, I mean, there were, there were good reasons for a reconciliation in the love letter. And uh, it starts by, he addresses his wife as a black Madonna. 
more beautiful than every, uh, any other black Madonna, the black Madonna of Verona, etc., etc. I mean, it is a very moving, cultured um, a piece of writing, the sort of thing one would usually not associate, it, associate with Karl Marx. Now, where do I think, uh, can we now say in retrospect, uh, Marx contributed something, and something of significance, uh, to our world, to our understanding of the world. And I hope what I'm going to say now will not look uh, being too, uh, uh, too much of uh, trying to use a language which is now very fashionable. Um, I would think that the most important contribution of Marx is the fact that Marx was one of the first thinkers who was able to combine in his understanding of the world evolving before his eyes, the world of the mid-19th century, he was able to give us a very sophisticated understanding of modernity, its technological, economic underpinnings, its social and cultural consequences, at the same time giving us also a critique of modernity. If you go back and I suggest you occasionally do it, and read the Communist Manifesto, not as a call to arms, which it obviously is, but as a document of social analysis. You will find that the first few pages are a song of praise to what modern capitalism, modern industry, the modern bourgeoisie did to the world. It united the world. It created a world market. It put down the barriers between various cultures. It even created a world literature. Again, if you wouldn't know this is Marx, and I do it occasionally with my students, I give them just this piece and ask them, who wrote this? They said, Milton Friedman. It sounds, it sounds like, you know, the most uncritical, stupid praise of capitalism. However, then there is the flip side. The attempt to understand that modernity is not only an achievement and a gift, but modernity and both its economic and social uh, context is also a challenge and a problem. That the kind of technology that for the first time gives us, gives modern men, and I'm saying man and not man and woman because Marx was writing in German and the German is not man but mensch. And mensch is mensch. This is not, this is generic, this is not just masculine, okay? So uh, giving men for the first time the ability to overcome scarcity through his technology, through his ability to shape the world because Marx sees human beings as being specifically beings that shape the world, change it. And this is, for Marx, the, speci the specificity of human beings. All other beings, including the uh, higher mammals, just take from nature, relate to nature as a given. Man changes nature. A uh, human being and a monkey eating a banana are not doing the same thing. The monkey eats a banana that is there. A human being eats a banana that has been transplanted from one clime to another and been watered and cultivated by the agency of a human will and human planning and human um, experience. So man is able to create his own world and therefore M Marx defines man as homo faber, man the creator, man the uh, one who does things, not uh, man the thinker or man the talking animal, man the creator. But, and this is where the dialectics of Marx thought comes in, the very processes which may it make it possible for human beings to emancipate themselves from the limitations and thrall of nature. They can transcend nature by inventing machines, multiplying the capacity for productivity. The same processes are also enslaving some human beings and making them the slaves or the 
uh, workers or the indentured laborers of other human beings. So the process of emancipation, which is modern industry, is at the same time also the process of uh, creating a new servitude. And this is what is the clash of modernity. And that's why modernity for Marx is so unusual, because all previous history were histories where the servitude of men, the fact that men, some human beings were uh, servants, some were serfs, some were slaves. This was in the nature of pre-modernity, in a situation of scarcity, where the sum total of things that human beings can produce is limited by the physical power of their hands. In a situation like that, there is no way to overcoming scarcity, and there the idea of servitude, the fact that some human beings are oppressed by others, is in the nature of the relationship, because there isn't enough. Modern technology gives us a possibility of overcoming scarcity because by having machines, by inventing machines, inventing machines that invent other machines and uh, create other machines, there is for the first time an infinity to the creative potentiality of human beings. But it is at that time that we have the maximum kind of servitude, the maximum kind of subjugation. And this is the internal contradiction of modernity. Now, Marx, of course, did not put it in, those way, in, those, in this language. He put it in a language which was, on one hand, influenced by, the, uh, by Hegelian uh, metaphysics or phenomenology and also by British political economy. But if we look carefully at what he is trying to say, and in this respect, he was so very different from many other socialists as well as for laissez-faire liberals or, or capitalistic thinkers. Because so many of other socialist thinkers who preceded Marx and uh, were in a way much more original in their understanding of the problems of modern society, saw modern society only as the enslaving agent didn't see modern society as the emancipatory agent. People like Fourier, Proudhon, so in industry itself, in technology as such, an enslaving element. And therefore they preach a return to a pre-industrial, agricultural, utopian, bucolic, idyllic uh, agricultural society, which is obviously nonsense. On the other hand, liberal thinkers, capitalist thinkers, uh, John Stuart Mill, the utilitarians, saw in industry only the emancipatory potential. They did not see the enslaving reality which was around them. Marx was one of the first, not the only one, but one of the first, who gave a theoretical underpinning to this tension that something as enormous as modernity can be at the same time both emancipatory and enslaving. And one has to make a choice here. And human beings and the process itself can end up either in more enslavement or in more emancipation. So if you view it in this context, it is obvious that we, since Marx, we are not thinking and cannot again think uh, about social issues in a, um, a way uh, in the same way again. So much of our social thought, so much of our sociology, so much of our economics, uh, so much of our philosophy and theology today uh, are built on that ambivalence about modernity. And the ambivalence is in Marx because the deterministic elements, which were later added to the Marxian uh, orthodoxy, are not as strong in Marx, uh, in Marx's thought himself. Uh, I don't want to do go into textual uh, criticism here, but Marx is very much aware that modernity is open to both possibilities. He hopes, he thinks, he knows that the contradiction of the capitalist system will in the end enhance the emancipatory as against the enslaving potential. But both of them are there. And he was in the middle of the phase of modernity where the enslaving element was much more stronger than the emancipatory. But he never forgot the emancipatory element there. And uh, today, again, we're, we cannot think about our society, our culture, the world as we know it. 
uh, without being aware of that contribution, which finds its way then into thinkers which are not only non-Marxist, but politically go in very different directions, like people like Weber uh, and, uh, and others. What went wrong? Because we know that the Soviet Union and everything that it represented collapsed. It's dead. It's buried. There may be some former communists or communists who want still to cling to the bureaucratic power, but communism as the driving motor of the Soviet Union is dead and buried. There's no doubt about it. What went wrong? Basically a combination of two things. The Marxian critique of modernity and the emancipatory promise which he thought in modernity were based on the Western European experience. When Marx wrote what he did in the Communist Manifesto and later in a much more sophisticated way in Das Kapital, he had in mind, of course, Western Europe, primarily England, France, Germany. Later, he included also, of course, after the Civil War, the United States. Marx always had doubts what's going to happen in Eastern Europe. He was worried. For many years, he was worried that there's going to be a revolution in the West, and then the Tsar will send those Cossacks into Western Europe and put an end to a socialist revolution in the West, something which has happened in different ways. When the Russian force, uh, the Russian army, after all, vanquished Napoleon and the French Revolution, or in the revolution of 1848, when Russian armies intervened in Prague and Vienna and Budapest and ensured the victory of the reaction, Marx was traumatized by the fact that there may be a possibility of a revolution in the West which would then be vanquished by the reactionary traditional autocratic forces of Russia. But be this as it may, if we look at what happened in Russia in 1917, we had something which was never envisaged, never planned, never seriously considered by any socialist thinker. I just want to remind you that in the Russian revolutionary tradition, People like Lenin, until the spring of 1917, were sure that once the Tsarist regime falls in Russia, and they were trying to do the best or worst to put it, uh, to put an end to it, the, then Russia, being basically pre-modern, pre-industrialized, pre-democratic, will go through a revolutionary phase of democracy or democratization and capitalism and that, of course, the working class movement, which was very tiny in Russia because the working class was very tiny in Russia, can enhance that development by being better organized than the bourgeois party. But uh, Lenin, until 1917, in the revolution of 1905 and 1917, said again and again that the next revolution in Russia is a bourgeois democratic. Lenin, nev Lenin never thought that the revolution in Russia the immediate one after the Tsar will be a socialist revolution. And as a matter of fact, this is what happened. When the Tsar abdicated or was forced to abdicate in February of 1917, uh, the provisional government, e eventually associated with the name of Kerensky, was a government based on the liberal, bourgeois, constitutional, democrat, and other, uh, and other parties. It was only in the summer of 1917 that Lenin changed his mind and this was under the pressure of the Russian defeat in the war. Let us remember the revolution, after all, happened in the middle of the war, or toward the end of the war. Uh, the weakness of the bourgeois democratic parties, the fact that there were no parties in Russia, if this sounds familiar, there are no parties today, but certainly in 1917 there were no parties in Russia. Political parties as an underpinning of a democratic structure. The ineptness of the uh, leaders of this bourgeois revolution, the growing resentment of workers and peasants who were mainly soldiers and had guns in their hands because they were soldiers. Again, this is not in the revolutionary program. Lenin changed his view. 
and from April, June 1917, begins to think that the next phase of the revolution will be socialist. This was a departure from his own views, from the views held by both the Bolshevik and the Menshevik wings of the Russian Social Democratic Party. And this was something which was a complete novelty. Nobody, with the exception of some, exception of some agrarian socialists who, who saw that in Russia you can move from Tsarism to agrarian socialism, nobody who was a Marxist of any hue ever thought that Russia can jump from Tsarism to socialism. To put it another way, a whole system of analysis and political program which was aimed at modern Western societies was imposed by the revolutionary dictatorship under the unusual conditions of 1917 by Lenin and the Bolsheviks on a pre-modern, pre-industrial, pre-democratic society. Socialism, which in the book of Marx was post, not post-industrial, but was after industrialization, post-industrial, post-bourgeois, post-democratic, was, uh, was imposed on a society which was pre-industrialized, no working class, no bourgeoisie. If you look at Marx's views of how he sees socialism, and there's very little about it, because he was not a utopian. He was not trying to give you wishful thinking, but the dialectical nature of his thoughts suggested that socialism in the West would be the perfection, so to speak, of democratic republicanism, that political equality democratic republicanism will be followed by social and economic equality, i.e. socialism. That uh, political emancipation, the French Revolution, will be followed by social emancipation. Never is there any intimation in Marx that there is a shortcut from pre-revolutionary, pre-industrialized, pre-modernity to socialism. And that's exactly what happened in Russia by the attempt of Lenin, which was successful, to catch power in this vacuum of summer and uh, autumn of 1917. And uh, as many of us who consider themselves in this context Mensheviks, okay, uh, have said for many, many years, the Leninist attempt was doomed from the beginning, not because of certain policies, not because of what Stalin did. Stalin made things, of course, much worse, but the idea that something that was aimed at the West, that was something post-modern or post-industrial, post-democratic in the West, could be imposed on a pre-industrial society. This is, this is basically nonsensical. It's unkind to say it in this way. The chances of a revolution, a socialist revolution in, in, in Russia in 1917 was as great as the chances of democracy in Uganda once the British left Uganda. And I don't want to, you know, to, to be invidious about the Ugandans. There, is no, there was no chance. And everything had to go wrong. Because if in the Marxian model, out of limited bourgeois democracy comes social democracy, whatever this may mean. It means that it is a further development of something which is stunted under bourgeois democracy. That, therefore, Marx could speak about the dictatorship of the proletariat as a democracy of the great majority, because the proletariat in the West was considered to be a majority. In Russia, where the proletariat were three, four million people among 150 million, obviously the only way was by a putsch, by a dictatorship of a small minority, by imposition, and by building not on the foundations of democracy and perfecting it and making the bourgeois limited democracy into a more perfect one, but in Russia, you had to build on the power that be and change it, which is you built Tsarism, you built on the foundations of Tsarism. And without going too much into what may appear as too clever dialectics, but if you abolish something, what you abolish determines the abolition. If you abolish democracy, democracy is in the abolition of democracy. But if you abolish, 
Zionism, and you build on the foundation of that, Zionism remains in the, aboli in the abolition of Zionism. So you had a neo-Zionism. Because this is the only thing that given the economic and social and cultural developments of Russia was possible. So it, to my mind, and many of us have been saying it for many, many years, of course, whether what was imposed on Russia in 1917 will succeed in terms of being able to hold power, all kinds of, uh, of regimes can hold power. Dictatorship, Saudi Arabia can maintain itself, I don't know how, but I mean, all kinds of countries can do it. So you, you can, uh, China may be able to maintain itself, but socialism it ain't going to be. It cannot be, from the very beginning. And not that they made a mistake, and not that Stalin, again, made things uh, worse. He made things worse. It is in the nature of the decision of 1917 to move to socialism that you have the internal cancer that was eating as the ability to create socialism. If you add to it that after 1945, this system was imposed on other Eastern European countries, some of them more developed economically and socially, with larger proletariats like the Russia in Eastern Europe, through the liberating Soviet army, again, Nowhere in, a Marx, in the Marxist book is the idea that socialism will be imposed by a conquering army coming from the outside. So the failure was there from the beginning. The fact that then you had forced collectivization, that then you had other uh, the short rides, made things only worse, just to add one minor detail. One of the basic things that Marxism and Marxists always suggested is that once the proletariat comes to power, you nationalize land. What Lenin did in 1917 was not nationalize land, but distribute land to the peasants in order to win their support, because they were the major uh, uh, sector of the population. Now, strategically, this was the right thing to do but it undermined the idea that this is going to be a socialist revolution. So the distribution of land to the peasants in 1917 created in the 20s a very unusual kind of po economic political system in Russia. You had a government that viewed itself as a representative of communism and the proletariat and its social infrastructure. The majority of the, of the citizens were uh, small holding peasants. Then, never mind, they were called kulaks by, by the official uh, communist ideology. Uh, and therefore, the collectivization in, 90, in, in the 30s was an attempt to make sure that the country is not going to be a peasant democracy. But uh, making something like a peasant economy was the price Lenin paid for being in power. In other words, when you do the wrong thing f f once, you have to do everything wrong later. This is the, I wouldn't like to use terms like original sin, but it is the original, God forbid, uh, but it is the original sin of the communist revolution. And this is, after all, the argument that those of us who consider ourselves democratic socialists always had with communists. This was the argument itself. It wasn't whether repression is okay or not, but even somebody who was a very radical socialist, like Rosa Luxemburg, said it in her uh, correspondence and, uh, and arguments with Lenin, that if you create socialism through a dictatorship, you're going to end up with a dictatorship. You cannot have socialism and oppression, because socialism is about perfecting already existing limited freedoms in bourgeois society. This is where things went wrong. Let me say where I think Marx himself was wrong in his assessment of modernity. And I'm not going to discuss issues of economic theory. I'll say something about that in a moment. But where Marx was basically wrong conceptually, and in this, he was a true son of the Enlightenment and had a lot of uh, things common with liberal Western thought, was in the underestimation of what we today call nationalism, or national feeling, or national culture. 
Everybody who has read the Communist Manifesto was is being struck by one of the strongest statements that are saying the proletarians and workers have no homeland, therefore they have no homeland to lose. And the basic concept behind it was that national culture is the culture of the ruling classes and the great masses of the proletariat being alienated from the culture, have no stake in the culture, and therefore they have only class consciousness, which is internationalist, transcends national borders. Uh, Marx saw that this is, thought that this is the case because the bourgeois capitalist mode of production is international, universal, transcend borders, ergo culture, regional, national culture will, will also be transcended first by capitalism, later by nationalism, and later by socialism. Uh, not only in retrospect, but there's no doubt that this was a major failure of perception. The last 150 years have proven to us that even if working class people may be alienated from a, the high culture, the bourgeois culture of their societies, they do relate to language, to memory, to history, to a feeling of home, nation, country. And one of the tragedies of the socialist movement insofar as it went in the Marxist direction was that it underestimated the fact that even working class people who may not be, uh, may not be speaking the King's English uh, or the Queen's English may not be aware of the high culture of Goethe or Racine or what have you do have a relationship to their culture. They are not totally alienated and abstracted human beings. And the tragedy was that because certainly Marxist socialism did not address those issues, did not address it, when the chips were down, like in 1914, socialism failed. Let me remind you that for 20, 15 years prior to World War I, the Second International, the Democratic Socialist International, educated working class people on the solidarity of workers, that French workers and German workers will never fight each other, regardless of what the captains of industries and the Junkers and the French uh, reactionary officers are going to do, because once they will try to get the people into war, the workers will down tools, will not be subjected to the draft, and will not fight. For 20 years, this was a great belief among not only working class people, even others thought, at least we know, that workers are not going to fight against workers. Within two months in the summer of 1914, this collapsed, and German workers became as patriotic and chauvinistic as German bourgeois and Junkers, and the same applies to French and, and, and Italian and, and English uh, workers. Uh, one of the more interesting thinkers of uh, socialist Zionism, uh, Chaim Arlozov, who is not very much known outside of Israel, has written a piece in 1919 as a young Jewish socialist in Germany of Russian origin uh, in which he suggested that the failure of socialists in 1914 to create true solidarity, not abstract solidarity, has not only the danger that really happened in 1914, but he said that if the working class movement after World War I, he was writing 1919, is not going to give to working class people in Europe, and he was talking about Europe, the feeling of country and culture and home, somebody else will give them that feeling. And writing this in 1919, before fascism, before Nazism, was really prophetic. And one of the reasons, I have no doubt, that fascism and national socialism in Germany were able to draw so much on working class support, and they did draw on working class support, and let's not fool ourselves that they didn't. They did was because of the fact that the abstract internationalism of the socialist international did not address questions of language and culture. I think now we know a little better. But one of the major failures of Marxist socialism 
was not reading correctly the fact that modernity is not totally abstracting cultures, that human beings in the end don't talk Esperanto. Well, well some Jewish intellectuals in Warsaw, like Zamenhof, of course, um, made it up. Who else but a Jewish intellectual uh, in Warsaw, you know, uh, who, 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 who is Polish and studied in Germany, but is part of the Russian Empire? Of course, he needs Esperanto. Nobody else needs Esperanto because uh, they, they have what they have. Eventually, also became Zionist. You know, it's, it's the same. Uh, it's the same dilemma uh, that uh, we do have now. I think a better understanding that, of course, nationalism has its awful potential for extremism and chauvinism and xenophobia and uh, aggrandizement and aggressiveness. But this does not mean that the feeling for language and culture and history and one's own tradition is by necessity uh, anti-humanist. It has to be based on mutuality, on the respect for the other, but it is something which is as much part of human beings as other things. Uh, and as I said, uh, liberalism uh, sometimes made the same mistake. You read John Stuart Mill, and he doesn't think that human beings uh, have anything to do with culture. Incidentally, Milton Friedman thinks the same. So uh, this abstract, less fair idea that everything is the market and human beings have no feelings that have to do with culture, which incidentally plays itself out again in Eastern Europe today. And when, after the collapse of communism, what we find is that people do revert, sometimes benevolently, sometimes not so, uh, to history and culture, which were precisely the sort of phenomena which were uh, totally uh, oppressed, suppressed by, uh, by Soviet-style communism. Let me say, one word about the West. Usually it's being said that, of course, Marx failed because the West did not become socialist. The West which Marx thought would become socialist, which is, of course, true, but not, not quite. One of the reasons that the West did not become socialist is that it's not capitalist the way it was under Marx. The kind of Western capitalism that we now know is very different from the kind of capitalism Marx encountered in 1848. I wouldn't like to call it capitalism with a human face, but it's capitalism with a human face. It is different. I mean, the capitalism Marx was talking about was 100% laissez-faire. No state intervention, no uh, public education, no social services, no welfare state, no working uh, men insurance, no pensions. It was the kind of dehumanized capitalism of its early development. And there's no doubt in my mind that one of the reasons why Western capitalism was able to maintain itself is because it has changed. And even in countries like the United States after Reagan and in, uh, in Britain after Thatcher, uh, there is enough of a social context to competition, to less affair, which makes it into a very different kind of society. You, you, you have uh, unemployment insurance, you have old aid insurance in some way, you have medical insurance of some sort. Now this is a very underdeveloped country, but you know, in civilized countries like Europe, Western capitalist Europe, you have of course uh, uh, medical insurance. That's, that's what capitalism is about, among other things. You're, you're beginning to discover it, that's okay. You have a new president who discovered it. So, uh, we d in a very subtle way, capitalism was able to survive precisely because it has read Marx. It realized that it cannot survive. I I'm reifying it, it, yeah. It realized that it cannot survive if it continues in this sort of unless unless a fair binge. Uh, and post Reagan and post uh, Thatcher, United States and um, Britain are also realizing it. So uh, the fact is that precisely because capitalism has changed and changed in a more social, socially responsible way, some will say not responsible enough, that's a met metaphor argument, but it is not the 19th century capitalism. So we are now in a world which is very different from the capitalist world of the 19th century. 
uh, and it, it does incorporate not only Marxian or post-Marxian or Keynesian or other or Prussian state socialist uh, ideas, which it does, uh, but uh, it does incorporate an element which was totally lacking from the Manchester type of wide lesser of her capitalism of the middle of the 19th century. One final word about what else? The Jewish question and Marx. Marx has written a very nasty piece called on the Jewish question. It's not a nice piece to read. It's even less nice if you're Jewish. It's even less nice if you're Jewish and socialist. It, it makes you cringe. It's not a pleasant piece to it. It is usually quoted and misquoted. Uh, I, I met a lot of people who have quoted it without having read it, because it has some, ve some very nasty punchlines. Uh, without, again, going into textual criticism, Marx's piece on the Jewish question is an argument against religious alienation, Jewish and Christian. For reasons that have to do with the context of the argument, he's saying very nasty things about the Jews, but then he says nasty things about Christians. But if somebody says nasty things about Christians, this is natural. But if he says about Jews, this is, he's an anti-Semite. So we should take it, you know, we should take it with a grain of salt. Those of you who, and it's an uncomfortable piece to read. It's so uncomfortable, let me try to tell you a story that has to do with the way it, it, it played out in Israel. Uh, Marx is always new. Jewish Marx is always new there was this piece. It was never translated into Hebrew until the 1960s. When I uh, started in the 1960s to translate Marx's early writings, his critique of Hegel, the economic philosophical manuscript, I also put, of course, this in translation. And the publisher was uh, the Ashomer Atzeir left-wing kibbutz publishing house. And I told them, I'm going, of course, to include the Jewish question. And by that time, they weren't Stalinists anymore. They were liberal. They were ready to live with contradictions. They said, that's fine. Uh, I prepared my trans uh, translation, and uh, I, went, I did it chronologically. And it so happened that uh, on the Jewish question was item number one. So when I uh, brought in the manuscript to uh, the Sifiat uh, Polim, Ashomer Atzeir publishing house in Kibbutz Merchavia, they looked at it and they said, well, of course, we're going to bring uh, the Jewish question. We're open-minded about it. But it may not be a good idea to have it, you know, as a first item. It may turn a lot of young people off. Well, let, let's have it at, the, at, the, at an appendix. I said, why an appendix? This is the first piece you wrote. And it has a lot of theoretical stuff there. Uh, so you needed a meeting of the Central Committee of Hashomer Atzeir to accept in the 60s that this should be the, uh, because I said, look, take it or leave it. I mean, otherwise, you're not going to get the manuscript. So. So reasonable people that accepted it. Uh, so even in the 60s, Jewish socialists in Eretz Israel found it a little bit uncomfortable to deal with what is a very, uh, what is a very uncomfortable piece. But let me introduce you to another piece of Marx on the Jewish question, not much known and much less important theoretically, but in a way interesting and funny. Uh, Marx, for many years, uh, lived. Uh, in London, as you know, and uh, made a living by writing uh, twice weekly articles for the New York Daily Tribune, which at that time was a radical left-wing New York uh, newspaper. Incidentally, uh, one Czech joke in 1968, when the Soviets came in, said, what would have happened to Marx? if he would have lived in Prague in 1968 and the Soviets would have apprehended him. He would certainly be in great trouble of Jewish origin, German, West German, married to a Christian aristocratic wife and having a friend, writing for American newspapers and having a friend who is a capitalist in living in Manchester by the name of Frederick Engels of a known capitalist family. So uh, it was this Marx who in the 50s wrote a, a number of pieces on the Crimean War. And one of the pieces, 1855, is about the Middle East. And it is not a very interesting piece intellectually. It tells the story of uh, the population of the Ottoman Empire. And then it says something about Jerusalem. And uh, he, it says that Jerusalem is a small city, 15,000 inhabitants, 10,000 of whom are Jewish. The Jews, Marx says, 
when are not uh, uh, natives to the place, most of them come from all, all over the world to die at the place where they think their redemption is going to come. And thus, facing Mount Moriah, where the temple of Solomon once stood, they pray for their redemption, despised by the Christians, uh, persecuted by the Turks, uh, and by the local population. They live in a small quarter called Haret el Yahud, the quarter of Jews, near the Dunk Gate. The geography is okay. Uh, it's the only place where Marx ever says anything about Jews which has some empathy for Jews. Because every time he mentions Jews, it's the Rothschilds and other types, and he doesn't have much empathy for them. It, uh, but the only time is the, uh, the poor Hasidic religious Jews of Jerusalem, which is very funny. Now, if, uh, in the 70s, I was once at a UNESCO conference where everybody was, was uh, hitting Israel on the archaeological digs in Jerusalem, and uh, the worst speech was not made by an Arab delegate, but by a Soviet delegate who accused us of Judaizing Jerusalem. I, I like the term, you know, Judaized Jerusalem. So I was head of the Israeli delegation, and uh, I said, I'm going to do this. So uh, in my response, I tried to suggest that uh, obviously we have problems in Jerusalem and there may be a point about some of the criticism. However, Jerusalem has had a Jewish majority since the middle of the 19th century, and it predates Zionism. And I said, uh, one of the greatest thinkers of the 19th century, some think he is the greatest thinker of the 19th century, said the following, and I read what I just, you know, paraphrased to you, I read the piece. And then I said, as I'm sure our Soviet uh, colleague recognizes, this is um, uh, Karl Marx writing in the New York Herald Tribune on September something, 1855. And the stupid uh, guy stood up and said, this is a falsification. <laughs> so I, I was a little bit prepared, so I took out the Soviet edition of Marx's writing. said, so, well, if this is falsification, the gentleman knows where it was falsified. It was falsified in Moscow, foreign, public, uh, foreign languages publishing house. Uh, and this was the end of it. This wasn't exactly the end of it. The end of it was that the Chinese delegate came up to me and so interpreter said, well, we didn't agree with what you said, but we always liked when somebody quotes Marx to the Soviets. <laughs> so as you realize, one can also have a lot of fun uh, with those things occasionally. Seriously to sum up, seriously to sum up, I think uh, if one looks at any great thinker one doesn't look at him asking how much of what he said was really realized or actualized. Plato, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they never were states, they never were attempts to establish states or regimes according to the model. And if there were attempts, they were pathetic. There were attempts to establish societies on the Marxian model in the wrong place in the wrong time, as I suggested. What one does look at a great thinker is to what degree he or she changed our perception of the world, enriched our understanding of the world and ourselves, and made it possible for us, on the basis of this more enriched and changed perception, move forward to a further, even more enriched, and even more complex view of the world. And in this respect, certainly Marx has done great service to our understanding of the world. And at a time when I think the Soviet Union will be long forgotten, Marx will be long remembered. Thank you very much. Um, I was told that the local custom allows for some questions or comments, so if somebody still has a patience and the audacity, <laughs> why not? Please. Yes, I, I have to look like this. Anybody? Yes, gentlemen over there. Why don't you stand up and...
students. 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 Yeah. In a way, something similar like this was postulated in '68 uh, during the student revolt in France, in the United States. Herbert Marcuse, at one stage, suggested that idea. Um, I think there are a number of problems here. One is a, a, a logical problem, the, the problem of past pro toto, that you take a part of a society and make it identical with a whole of society. It didn't work with the working class. Now, the problem with students is that being a student with some exceptions, those of us who are eternal students, is a transitory phenomenon. So we don't talk here about a, a group of people who are what they are and will continue to be what they are. Now, this does not say that people who are students or young people may not in cert on certain occasions be the igniter of a major change. You gave two examples, and I think they are a little bit problematic. I, let's agree about Czechoslovakia. Let's say it was basically students, not only students. China shows how it doesn't work. It, doesn't, it didn't work with China. This was a heroic, pathetic failure. So uh, I wouldn't like to identify, and I think we have a problem here. Sometimes one says students and intellectuals. What do we mean by intellectuals? Uh, does it include all biologists, physicists, other intellectuals, engineers? Uh, do you have to have a degree? I don't think so. Uh, the, we were talking about fuzzy terms. There's no doubt, however, that there are groups in society who are those groups who are the critical groups in society, the intelligentsia, so to speak, the intellectuals, surely. The problem, however, is, and I think we have to be open about it, that not in every case are the intellectuals, if they are leading society, uh, if they're radicalizing society, radicalizing it in what we consider to be a progressive, left-wing, whatever way. After all, uh, Dr. Josef Goebbels was an intellectual of sorts. Um, the present head of the murdering Serbs in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is a psychologist, Dr. Karadic, a war criminal, or head of a war criminal organization. And I could give you other names as well. Uh, so um, the problem of identifying certain groups, which is as the conscience of the revolution of change uh, is a thing more problematic. What I would like to look at are situations. I think there are situations where you can identify a potentiality for this kind of emancipatory situation. I think Marx was right when he said that in revolutionary times, a group may become, he called it the university class, he identified it with the proletariat. A group may be the spokesman for all of society. But I don't think we can identify a specific group. I wouldn't like to compound the Marxian, uh, what I consider the Marxian fallacy of identifying the proletariat with humanity at large by, for, by looking for other partial groups. In every situation, I think, one can identify. I don't think there is one group that can be identified universally. Yeah, you stated that uh, Marx changed uh, our view of society and ourselves. Could you tell us what his view was of ourselves? What, is, what was his view of human beings, of uh, the ultimate reality, of the reality of life? I mean, how do you justify human existence in terms of Okay. Okay. I think uh, to do justice to Marx as well as to your question, one has to say that Marx would, uh, would relate in a different way. And let me go back to what I tried very briefly to say earlier. Uh, Marx saw human beings as being unique in the universe by being able to change reality and being able to change reality consciously. Marx made a very interesting comment in one of his early manuscripts when he said, on one hand, men change reality, change nature, and then he says also bees do it and beavers do it. 
And, but he said there's a difference. In the case of the bee, the mechanism is an extension of its biological determination. The bee can do only one thing, produce honey. Human beings, it cannot decide at one time when the price is right to produce oil. Human beings can do it because they have consciousness. In Das Kapital, which is a very late, I mean a late piece of writing, Marx says something very interesting when he says, uh, sometimes when we look at uh, what a, oh, how do you say it in English, um, a kavish, can you, somebody help me here? A spider, thank you. Uh, when we look at a spider web, uh, it's a very beautiful uh, construction. And when we look at a building built by human beings, the building can be very ugly. However, there's a difference. The spider constructed this beautiful web, not consciously, but because this is the, the uh, biological determination that makes him do those uh, things, L like, uh, like, like a flower, which can be very beautiful. While the human being, even if he builds a very ugly building, uh, he had a plan, he had, con he had a consciousness. So uh, while Marx, I don't think, ever agonized over the question of the meaning of life, this is a kind of thing which if you are a materialist, you don't really agonize over. But he did agonize over the question of how does uh, human being, how do human beings relate to nature, and human beings, according to Marx, relate to nature in a way in which they change nature and change it consciously which is the long and the short, I think, of what Marx said, and you can read a lot into it because it means that human beings construct their own world. There is a material substratum there, but we construct uh, our world. And I think this is a very unique contribution. Goes back to Hegel, but it is putting Hegel on his feet. We know the dialectical trick Marx did here, but uh, it is, I think, his specific contribution to what one can call philosophical anthropology. Beyond that, I think the other aspects of your question are outside the purview of what I think really interested Marx. I'm glad you brought it up. Okay. Okay, let me start from uh, the, your second comment, but I think I agree more than with the first. Uh, I, Marx did say that he's not a Marxist, but uh, so many other things, you know, things are quoted out of context. Mar I'm sure you know uh, what the context was. I want just to recapitulate it. Uh, Marx was presented very late in his life by writings of Russian uh, socialists who said that in uh, Russia there is a predetermined development that will make Russia first capitalist and then socialist. And Marx uh, responded saying this is a possibility. I'm not sure this is going to happen. It may happen. Something different may happen as well. And if those people say they're Marxist, I'm not a Marxist. So Marx did not say I'm not a Marxist. It's like saying, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, it's like saying, uh, let's take, uh, you know, if Ivan the Terrible is a Christian, I'm not a Christian. This is, you know, this. Uh, uh, I think in this sense it was said, uh, it's not that he was not a Marxist, he was not a Marxist when he related to certain people who he thought were interpreting him in a very over-deterministic way. But let me go back to the first point, which I think is very important, where I think we, we slightly disagree. Now, Marx is not the first person to suggest that e the e economics is a science. 
and he himself acknowledges uh, his debt to James Mill, John Stuart Mill's father, John Baptiste Say, French economist, Turgot, others. So Marx did not invent modern economics. However, when we talk about science, if you look at the 32 volumes of Marx's published works, uh, only once does Marx speak about scientific socialism. But he doesn't speak about it in English, but in German. And excuse me for being a little bit schoolmasterish for a moment. When we say science in English, we, may nat we mean natural science. Science as against humanities, right? Now, in German, Wissenschaft is not a natural science. Wissenschaft is a totality of knowledge, what Plato would call episteme. Uh, Hegel's major, one of Hegel's major work is called the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Philosophischen Wissenschaften, the Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences. And you realize this sounds very strange in English. Uh, the humanities in German are called Geisteswissenschaften. If I translate it literally, it's spiritual sciences. You know, it sounds like spiritualism or some sort of nonsense like that. There are no spiritual sciences. It's spiritual knowledge. Um, in Germany in the 19th century, there were people who were talking about Wissenschaft des Judentums. This is the science of Judaism? No, this is a study of Judaism. Uh, so when Marx was saying that he is doing it in a Wissenschaftlich way, you're right. He was saying this is rational. There is a method in it. This is not wishful thinking. He was saying it in contradistinction to people like the utopians who were concocting a beautiful city on the hill and saying this is how society is going to look. And he said, how do you know? What we have to do is to study society and know it. So I would be very careful on this linguistic barrier to use the term science in the way in which it is used in the English language, where it is natural science. This is not the way Marx uh, was meaning it. Now you mentioned Darwin, and this is very interesting, because again, this is true. However, there is a context. When Marx published Das Kapital, uh, he was working very hard. By that time, he was already living in England for 15 years. He was not known in Germany. The book was published in Germany, in Hamburg. Very few people have ever heard of, the, of Marx in Germany. Some revolutionaries remember, but nobody heard. And this was, you know, 200, volume one, 250 pages, a very heavy term. So he was very busy making sure that there would be reviews of the book, which all of us authors do. He did it in a way which most of us authors, I hope, don't do. He asked one of his friends, uh, Engels, to write reviews, and um, Engels wrote about 15 reviews under different names. Uh, why not help a friend? Okay, all for a good cause. And then something very funny happened. Um, in, uh, there was a newspaper published in Württemberg, in South Germany, in Stuttgart, I don't at the moment recall the name. Volkszeit, I, I'm not sure. Anyway, it, it was a laissez-faire Manchester liberalism newspaper. And the editor of the newspaper, obviously a very provincial German editor, heard that an Englishman, an Eng a German living in England by the name of Dr. Karl Marx, I mean, he has the right prefix, wrote a book called Das Kapital. And he thought this was a book justifying capitalism. So he also heard that this Dr. Marx has a friend who is a Manchester industrialist by the name of Engels, who writes reviews of this book. So he wrote a letter to Engels asking him to review this great treatise on capitalism by Dr. Karl Marx. And from the context of the letter, it was clear that this uh, provincial German uh, editor thought this was a great pamphlet for capitalism. Engels got the letter, sent it to Marx. You know, thank God at that time there was no telephone. We have the letters. We know today we, we, we would have a telephone conversation. Um, Engels sent the letter to Marx and said, what should we do? I mean, obviously, this guy doesn't know what it is all about. Marx, being either smart or desperate, I don't know, suggested, you know, this is a very unusual opportunity to get a review into the enemy's camp. So why don't you write the following? What Charles Darwin 
did to the natural sciences, Dr. Marx is doing to the human sciences. One doesn't have to agree with what he said, but da 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 da. The ten lines which Lenny, eh, with Lenny, which Engels then lifts from the letter from Marx and writes as a review, and this review appears. When Marx dies, Engels obviously forgot the whole story, and then he said on the funeral oration what Darwin did to natural sciences, Marx did to man science. But this is the origin of this now, this is documented. I had lots of fun some 20 years ago finding that, because it's obviously there, but you have to combine it. You, when you look in the Marx-Engels correspondence at what Marx did write about Darwin, it's very interesting. When Marx first read The Origin of Species, he wrote to, uh, to Engels and said to him, look at this Darwin. This is an Englishman whose world is so, t I'm, I'm paraphrasing, okay, I don't remember. It's verbatim. This is an Englishman whose world is so totally determined by the market, by competition, by survival of the strongest, that when he looks at plants, that's where, what he sees, modern capitalism. <laughs> now, just a and therefore he wanted to uh, dedicate Das Kapital to, uh, to Darwin. Now, Darwin wasn't a fool. He exactly realized why he was being set up here, and then he declined the honor. So this is a story which I think says something about intellectual developments and the relationship, and there is a relationship there, but it's not that it's, you know, this is Darwin, this is Marx, the two great men who, whatever, knocked down religion, theology, etc. much more complicated. Yes? Uh, am I ready to get into the question of determinism, which the gentleman here calls a uh, phony issue, which I think I agree, uh, and what did Marx say about determinism? Uh, the long and the short of it is that uh, certainly Marx believed in causality, but when it came to human affairs, Marx always insisted that there is an agency of consciousness. That's why his insistence on proletarian consciousness. If the revolution is just the outcome of the anonymous, impersonal forces of the market, it doesn't really matter what the worker thinks. The revolution will break out by itself. By insisting that you have, on one hand, an objective situation, which is what's happening in the marketplace, etc. But then, in order to have a revolution, you have to educate. You have to make people aware of what they are, the working class that knows that it is the wave of the future behaves differently from the working class that doesn't know that it is the wave of the future. So there is always the agency of human will. And therefore, I agree with you that this is a phony issue. Certainly, Marx never suggested that the kind of determinism which 19th century science thought that it finds in the natural science, and now we know a little better, uh, would be found in human affairs. It's always a human agency. Things can always be different. There have to be reasons. There have to be differences. There have to be identifiable reasons why a certain development goes one way, why certain things happen in England rather than in France, while uh, on many levels uh, societies are similar, but they're not that similar. It's a very unsatisfactory answer, I'm afraid, but this is as far as I can go now. Do we have more questions? Yes. Sorry, sorry, the lady over here. Yes, and he didn't like them. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, yes. Uh, no, this is, uh, I think, a very serious question because uh, he was acquainted, there were two levels of his acquaintance with workers. Uh, since 1843, Marx lived in Paris, and his first acquaintance was with French working class people. 
And I don't want to call it the romantic period, but the first acquaintance was very refreshing to Marx. And it's interesting because Marx, what he very much was impressed by in the French workers was not the intellect, not the understanding of the three uh, laws of contradiction of modern economy, uh, but what he considered to be the solidarity. And he writes in a very moving piece in the German ideology, uh, when you go into a French pub and you see the camaraderie and you see the solidarity and you see the readiness of one for all, etc., you see that here we have the nucleus of future society. It's slightly romanticized, but I think he got something about working class. Uh, later on, when he was in England, he had two kinds of acquaintances with two kinds of workers. One was with a very large group of German migrant workers who were living in England. Most of them were not industrial workers, but really artisans or on the margin of artisans. And then English class workers, East Side, uh, East End uh, uh, workers. And again, we have from the correspondence uh, reports about his uh, attempts, uh, and there were many, uh, to give lectures on uh, principles of political economy uh, to English and German workers. It appears that they were not very successful. I can see why. I mean, reading Das Kapital is heavy stuff. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not only for workers, and even the simplified version. There are occasional outbursts in Marx. I've never seen idiots like those German workers with whom I talk tonight. Incidentally, when the good social democrats, uh, Lieb, uh, uh, Kautsky and Bernstein, edited the Marx Engels correspondent, they excised uh, a lot of things. Uh, they excised any uncomplimentary statement about workers any uncomplimentary statement about Jews, any uncomplimentary statement about the Germans. In other words, anything that wasn't really good German bourgeois was excised. Uh, and uh, I don't think, the, I, I think Marx had a realistic assessment. The person who might, knew much more about workers, of course, was Engels, who wrote some studies about the, his first book, The Condition of the in, in, uh, Working Class in England. He was also a manufacturer. He, had, he was uh, owner of a factory that employed uh, some 500 workers, a uh, very ambivalent position for a socialist to be, but at least he knew what he was uh, talking about. I think the one aspect one should remember here that certainly in the case of Marx there was no idealization of the worker. It's a kind of nonsense we find in later socialist realism. You know, this muscular uh, worker of Soviet uh, iconography uh, who sort of protects uh, women and children uh, with a noble, simple but noble face. That kind of garbage you don't find in Marx. And I think the reason for this is very philosophical. The worker in capitalist society, as Marx saw it, cannot be noble and knowledgeable and kind. He is not. He is a vicious human being. He beats his wife. He sends his daughters to prostitution. Marx says those things. Because this is what society is making him. Because if he would have been noble and wise and gentle, he doesn't have to be redeemed. Neither does society uh, to have to be redeemed. So there is, I think, again, there is a, a contradiction here. How do you base a revolution on people like that? You have to educate them. You have to create among them a knowledge and consciousness of understanding. This is not revolution through education, but education and knowledge is a prerequisite for that kind of revolution. You mean it when it's older, one can become a little bit anti-Semitic, but not when I was young. <laughs> no, uh, no, seriously. Uh, again, one has to read the piece. The piece is written in response to a tract by a young Hegelian of Christian Protestant clerical background by the name of Bruno Bauer, who wrote a piece in 1842 
at the time when the question of the emancipation of Jews in Germany came up, Bauer writing that Jews should not be emancipated because a Jewish person is still in thrall to the old vengeance God of the Old Testament. And the only way the Jews can be emancipated is that first they should become Christians and then they should become atheists, but first Christians because only as Christians can they be emancipated from religion, because Jewish religion is Old Testament, etc. Marx's piece on the Jewish question is written in response to Bauer, in which he argues for the emancipation of the Jews, saying that in modern bourgeois society, Christians and Jews are equally enthralled to uh, false consciousness. And therefore, Jews and Christians, everybody else, have a right to be politically emancipated. They are not yet humanely emancipated. This will be done only in the revolution. And then he goes on into uh, what he considers to be the, religious, the element of religious enslavement. And that's why he said some very nasty things, as I said, about Jews and about Christians. Now, uh, he says, when he it moves into discussion of Jews, he said, Bauer, because he's a theologian, looks at the Jew, at the Sabbath Jew, as an ideal Jew. One should look not at the Sabbath Jew, but at the everyday Jew, which is, I think, a good point, especially if you're a materialist. And then you would expect him to say something about the reality of Jewish life. The point is that Marx didn't know anything about the reality of Jewish life. If you read the he says that the God of the Jew is a star, is a promissory note. Maybe. And then he said, and that's exactly what the Christians do as well. One should remember, everything which is said about Jews is also said about Christians. But it's nasty. The only, I once read it, I tried to deconstruct it and ask myself, writing about the Jews, what did they know about real Jews, about real Jewish life? What did he do? Did he know about uh, Jewish uh, religious observance? Nothing, with one exception. And uh, excuse me for bringing it up, but it's there. He says that Jews, even if they go into the toilet, they have a benediction because they're really crass materialists. They make even the toilet ablutions of the body. Uh, into an object of religious observance, which means that he has known something about one of the Jewish benedictions. It's not the most important one. Some of you may not even recognize it, but there is one like this. So uh, I guess where did he pick it up? It sounds like a graffiti in a high school or something like that. So uh, the, the thing that one can say about the piece is that it is full of ignorance about the Jews. It's not full of ignorance about Christianity, because he went, of course, as a good uh, son of a Christian family to a German Protestant uh, gymnasium and learned a lot about Christianity. Uh, I still don't know why, because it's not necessary he made those uh, statements there. I don't know why. I have no answer for that. Not that I know of, uh, not that I know of, and if you look at it, there's nothing specific about any specific Jews. He doesn't say that all Jews are capitalists. He said that the spirit of capitalism is a Jewish spirit, and so is the spirit of Christianity, which is a statement about Europe of the 19th century, with too much accent of the, on, the, on the Jewish side, I agree. No, uh, okay, uh, one more question then. Zilch. Um, uh, Russia doesn't move only from communism to the free market, or is supposed to move. Russia, as it is today, is doing what it is. After 75 years of communism and 400 years of Tsarism, with no tradition of civil society, a very minuscule tradition of the Enlightenment, of no private property in land, of no tradition of individualism, 
of a great fear, which is not just a communist fear, but the Russian historical fear of the West and its corrupting influence, of a church that never went through reformation or even counter-reformation. So to imagine, and this is really not the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, subject of my talk, but if my chairman asks me, I have no choice. Uh, to imagine, now let me put it another way. When communism collapsed in the Soviet Union, there was such a triumphalism in the West. Finally, we have won that uh, the common wisdom in the West was that everything will now be okay because communism is out, communism is out, so liberalism, democracy, the market, tolerance will flower. The point of the matter is that none of those societies before, with one exception, the Czech lands, n none of the Eastern European societies before it became communist was a democracy. They have very little to draw on. Countries like Hungary, Poland have some traditions, and even there the situation is not easy. But certainly in the Russian case, where Russia has to do three things at the same time, to democratize the political system, to introduce, if not the market, but elements of the market into Russian society, and to dismantle an empire. And to do those three things at the same time. Now, to imagine that you can introduce capitalism and democracy into Russia within a year or two seems to me as far-fetched as the Leninist attempt in 1917 that you could introduce socialism. There is something of a Bolshevik mentality. You know, make, be, communism is dead, but the Bolshevik mentality, and I'm using it in a sort of pejorative sense, that the Bolshevik mentality of people like Yeltsin that, you know, you introduce capitalism by decree. Maybe it will take 300 days, we have 500 days with, with this plan or that plan. Lenin thought you can introduce socialism by decree. Capitalism, democracy in the West took hundreds upon hundreds of years with ups and downs. And even there, there were imperfections, there were terrible things like Nazism in the middle. So the chances of a transition, not in countries like Hungary and Czechoslovakia, which are nation states with some t parliamentary tradition. They're still problematic, but they are. In Russia, I don't think there is a chance. And if I would have to bet, I said it two weeks ago on Israeli TV, and I'm either right or wrong. I said that before the end of the year, Yel Yeltsin will be either out, or a dictator, or a figurehead. To imagine that he will be the head of a democratic Russia moving more or less uh, peacefully to a democratic evolution and the introduction of a market is completely out of, uh, out of this world. Now, I said before the end of the year, it, depends, it appears that I'm wrong. It's already happening uh, now. And I, as you realize, I'm very pessimistic here. And uh, the reason is that uh, neither socialism, certainly not democracy in the market, cannot be built by decree, cannot be introduced from above. They are an outcome of historical processes that take dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of years. Things can be accelerated. We are in the end of the 20th century. It, under the best of conditions, it can happen, but it will be a very long and painful and painful. Um, a process. If you ask me what can the West do about it, my guess is very little. To give you one example, everybody talks now one should help Russia economically, which is fine. Now what does it mean help Russia economically? It means inject money into the Russian economy. Which sector of the economy can be injected with money? The existing industrial complexes, which are exactly those structures in Russia that you want to democratize and privatize. So if you send money to Russia now, or, or credits, or whatever, you are helping to strengthen those pillars of the conservative element, if, it is, if this is the, the, the term, existing in Russia. So when empires collapse, when systems like Russia collapse, it takes a very long time until the pieces fall uh, together. I remember we had a discussion at Columbia University two years ago at the, you know, at the height of the euphoria after uh, what happened in 1989, this was 1989, this was the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, everybody was making comparisons, and everybody said, look how, how, how peaceful this is. And 
because I occasionally like to be the devil advocate, I said, wait a moment. Let's put ourselves back in the mindset of somebody who witnessed the French Revolution in the year 1789. By the end of the year 1789, the French Revolution looked very peaceful. France was transformed from an um, absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy with very little violence, no executions, by a, a consensus uh, uh, of practically all orders and classes of society. But uh, it takes two or three years. So we're only in 1989. This was 1990. So we're only in 1990. Let's wait until 1992, 1993. Now we're in 1993. And we still don't have the Jacobin terror that I don't expect it, but we have a much more messier and much less peaceful transition. And I think to think that we are in transition to something which within a couple of years will settle down, we are in for, my favorite text here is Act, two, scene, act One, Scene Two of Boris Godunov, the opera, when the people want a czar because there is no bread, there is no order. I think this is really the agenda for Russia. Do we have one more question? I think we have time for this. Okay, last two questions. Uh, the gentleman before spoke of the two and a half question marks, what does Marx have to do Can you stand up because I can't hear you? I think I, I agree, but I think the metaphysics is much more nearer to that of uh, Hegel, because in this way, in this sense, Hegel was also an 18th century uh, universalist. What I think uh, Marx overlooked is that uh, when we talk about humanity, uh, humanity is not made up of individuals, or not made up of individuals as just members of rather abstract classes. Humanity is a community of communities. In this respect, if I may give another example, it would be uh, the example of Mazzini, sort of a, a radical nationalist with a social conscience, who argued that by being a member of my country, my nation, my culture, I am a member of humanity, and my being a member of humanity is mediated through my culture, through the specific language in which uh, I speak, I think, I, uh, I create. And I think today, uh, when we look at uh, the development and the problematic development in the third world, uh, we realize that uh, human beings are not emancipated in an abstract way. They are emancipated through the being able to integrate their specific culture into a wider culture. Uh, to put it dialectically, of course, nationalism has to be overcome. I'm, I'm very much for it. But first, you have to have it in order to overcome it. Only somebody who feels comfortable within his own nation, who thinks that his nation, his country, his culture are assured, only then can he reach out to other human beings on the basis of equality. If you deny human beings their culture, their history, they're not going to be nice to other human beings. They're not going to recognize in the other what they still uh, lack in themselves. The last question at the back. Um, so you, you were thinking about uh, Marxism and how Marx is in, in this role as creator of the 20th century. As one looks forward to the future, you've got this massive corpus of Karl Marx's works, which have uh, been an inspiration to many people this century. As a result of what's happened this century, people have had various problems with regards to his works, and a certain amount of reassessment has gone on. 
Abba Ibn, not a great Marxist, um, has said that it's very difficult to prophesy, especially about the future. Uh, and without being glib, I think that one of the things that I learned from Marx, and one of the things where I think Marx did enrich our understanding, is that one, it is d difficult enough to understand the present by studying it, by having empathy to it, but at the same time having a distance from it. So I, and, and therefore they saw very little in Marx about the future. When you put together all of what Marx said about the future, future socialist society, it doesn't add up to 20 pages. Das Kapital is a torso of three volumes, unfinished, more than a thousand. It's called Das Kapital, not Der Sozialismus. And that's not an accident. So I, I'm very uncomfortable with trying to do this projection. But I would still say that if I look at the various uh, schools of Marxism or the various uh, interpretations, uh, let me take this opportunity to knock some of them. Uh, Marxism is not, cannot be a method of teaching literature. And we have seen, and I understand the sociology of knowledge of it, we have seen a situation in which precisely because the Marxist revolution politically has failed, uh, many scholars who were brought up and contributed a lot uh, to socialist or Marxist thinking uh, have been, uh, in the end, uh, using it as a method for the deconstruction, if this is a term, of literature. Uh, it, it is a very sorry state that, say, in the American academia, uh, Marxism is much more stronger in the departments of English than in the department of sociology. Something must be wrong there. So if I would like to suggest which of the applications of Marxism has a future and can contribute to our, our understanding without minimizing an attempt you know, to, to introduce social insight or social deconstruction or even Marxist interpretation to literature, the main task would be, after all, the understanding of society, not as a text, but the society as a social historical reality. I know this is a very unsatisfactory answer to your question, but that's as far as I can go. I'd like to thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.